Welcome back to Rings and Realms. Well, episode seven of the Rings of Power was a much calmer, it was an aftermath episode following the very intense events of episode number six. However, we can see there was a lot of richness to it. There were many themes that had been brought f further along and even several themes from earlier episodes that were brought back together. Everything is building together as we begin to approach the finale. Let's talk about it. Before we get to the theme of healing in episode seven, I wanna first go back and talk about something I neglected in episode six. There was so much to talk about in that conversation between Adar and Galadriel that I didn't get to the, the reference that we got to the fact that Sauron was attempting to bring healing to Middle-earth. That seems like kind of a big deal, right? Um, now this was characterized, right? He's gonna bring healing, he's gonna bring order. I think that um, healing is, do, do I think this suggests that Sauron is really a good guy or this shows that Sauron has changed its, his ways? No, no, I think that this means that he thinks that he is the solution. He should be in charge of Middle-earth. That healing Middle-earth from Sauron's point of view looks like putting things back in order the way that he would want them to be. Surely there is a lot of chaos in the post-Morgoth period of Middle-earth and things that Sauron wants to straighten out. But I don't think it means that he really has the best in heart for everybody. Now, um, however, with that, let's now turn to episode seven. Um, the stranger, of course, I think is really becoming the center of the whole theme of healing so far in this show. Um, more and more his actions are focused on healing. We saw him doing this with his own arm, right, when his own arm was injured back in episode five. And now, of course, we see him healing the tree, but not only the tree, we see him renewing the entire grove, right? As the, the, the fires have fallen from heaven, uh, the fires have fallen from where Mount Doom exploded and destroyed a large part of the grove by the time the Harfoots arrived. And yet he makes all of the, of the the dead, the burned trees, right, which are not apparently totally dead. Uh, we can see some of the, 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 the living heart of the tree beneath the blackened exterior. Um, but he renews it. He brings them all back and makes them all fruitful again in order to provide the Harfoots with food, right? So this is, the, this is what the, the major thing that we see. And again, this is growing to be a really central idea about the stranger. However, the stranger Unlike Sauron, who wants to bring healing to Middle-earth by providing order, his order, so that everything runs apparently, I think, exactly as he would want it to run, the stranger is an agent of chaos, right? Uh, that guy has no idea what he's doing. We saw from the beginning he is, well, from after he first landed, way back in episode two, we saw that he had no idea how to speak, he had no idea who he was, he's been learning, right? He, they're able to converse with him now, or at least to talk at him and have him understand, um, even though he does not 
deliver many long speeches of his own, right? At least not in English to the rest of the characters. But we see that he's not really in control of his actions. We saw this when he was uh, uh, hurting Nori. He didn't hurt her long term. Her hand was not damaged by the little freezing incident in episode five. Um, Nor are she or Dilly crushed by the branch when it falls off the tree. But again, clearly he is not in control here. This, of course, all brings us back to what the conversation we heard with him and Nori at the beginning of episode five, when there was that little debate, right, as to whether or not he was a peril or whether or not he was good. That's what Nori says in contrast, right? She rebukes him, right, for calling himself a peril. She corrects him by saying, no, 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 you're good. You're good. And and he was saying, I'm I'm good, right, as if trying to tell himself that. Um, He is clearly a peril in one sense, right? He's a danger to himself and others, as we have seen in both episode five and episode seven. And yet there's no question that his intentions are good and that his powers are primarily directed towards healing. My question that I have that, that episode seven really left me with about the stranger is what is his larger purpose? What is his goal? What is the higher purpose for which he and Nori have been brought together, which Nori was was perceiving all the way back in episode two, right? There's some reason they've been brought together. There's some larger purpose to be filled. I would guess that it has something to do with renewal, with healing. I don't know exactly what that is yet. So we will have to wait and see. I am hoping that in episode eight, I don't think, of course, that we're going to get a resolution to the plot line of The Stranger fully, of course. It's only the end of season one out of five, after all. But I am hoping that in episode eight, we get a little bit more of a hint as to what his trajectory is. What exactly is he meant to do? Where are we going with The Stranger's story after this? So we'll see what we see there. Of course, another place where we saw healing very significantly uh, focused on in episode seven was the, the mithril chunk, right, healing the leaf, cleansing the leaf of its corruption. And this, of course, suggests that the mithril will be effective in combating the corruption of the tree. Now, I'm going to talk later on about the whole mithril thing. What does this mean? There were a lot of people who were asking a lot of questions about this. Um, Does this mean that it's all true? We talked about this after episode five. I was saying that I think there's a lot of untruth and a lot of misunderstanding interwoven among the, 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 the many true facts that were being given to us back in episode five. Um, I am uh, not yet ready to uh, rescind all of those things. I still believe most of Most of what I said uh, after episode five, we'll look at some of the qualifications, some of the ways in which new evidence uh, suggests some different things. Um, But as I say, we'll do that a little bit later. Um, The the big question, does this mean that Mithril can heal the elves? Um, We will see. It's important that we're asking this question. That's very much what especially Durin and Elrond are focused on, right? But what did we actually learn about that? Tune in a little bit later and we'll talk about that. The last thing, of course, we end the episode with an emphasis on healing as well, right? Um, There's Halbrand after, I don't know about you, but I had almost forgotten about him. But here we found him again at the end of the episode, um, wounded with some unknown wound, right? Which has apparently gone sour, as Bronwyn says. I I don't know what that means. It's gone septic, like it's gotten an infection. Um, But she says it's beyond their power to heal. Uh, Galadriel says that it needs elvish medicine. So a couple things there. First, um, the unknown wound that he has received, what kind of wound is it? Why should he have received a wound which is different? Who stabbed him in the belly? Nobody else emerging out of the town has seen any kind of combat at all. There was no attack, further attack by the orcs or anything like that. Um, where did Halbrand get his wound? We don't really know, right? Um, why should he alone have received a sword wound or some kind of Uh, uh, some kind of stab wound, right, or slashing wound, um, and nobody else did. 
Now, another thing that, of course, many people have been uh, very perceptively observing is that Galadriel's reference to elvish medicine uh, would seem in contradiction to what Arondir said back in episode one about how they don't really have healers for the body among the elves, uh, but instead they have artificers, right? That is, they have people who, through beauty, refresh the soul rather than tending to the body, which he said elvish bodies pretty much bounce back, you know, on their own, and they don't really need healing. And so it struck many people as rather odd that Galadriel started talking about elvish medicine. I thought elves didn't have medicine, right? So one way I think to understand this, and I'm not 100% sure exactly what Galadriel is referring to here, I'm going to be interested to see where she goes with that in episode 8 whenever they, when they get to wherever they're going, which I believe presumably to be a Regian. But... Um, uh, nevertheless, the one other way I can think that we can understand this is we should remember that Arondir and Galadriel are, there are elves and elves, you know. Uh, they're very different kinds of elves. Arondir is a sylvan elf, and Galadriel is, an, is one of the Noldor, right? So I suspect that the Noldor, who are in many ways more advanced in technology than the sylvan elves, who... Um, are you know, so the idea that the Sylvan Elves might not do any healing, that they just sort of, you know, they live in the woods and closer to nature and they just sort of let themselves recover, whereas the Noldor might have been a little more meddlesome in this regard and have actually, you know, uh, been doing some advances, making some advances uh, in medical technology and medical techniques. That seems to me possible. Um, especially in their more active role in coming back and trying to govern and heal and help uh, Middle Earth, right? The Sylvan elves kind of tend to be more isolationist and keeping to themselves and doing their own thing, them and the forest and everything, whereas, again, the Noldor uh, take a little more active role. So it wouldn't surprise me to learn uh, that the Noldor did more of this than the Sylvan elves do, and I think that perhaps is why we're seeing that difference between Galadriel and Arondir. But the last thing I want to say here is that I think I thought the little scene with Halbrand at the end, Halbrand and Galadriel, friends, you know, she called him friend. It was good. But anyway, um, that scene was interesting in a couple ways. One of the things that I found there is that there is a sense in which a, Halbrand's situation seemed almost like a little microcosm, like the whole sequence at the end with Galadriel coming in and taking him off to be healed seemed like a little recapitulation of their whole plot line so far, right? Um, he is there, he is, was off somewhere, we don't know where he was, and he's bearing a wound, which we don't know where it is. That's how he is when we meet him. We don't know about his past. We don't know where he came from. Something has wounded him in the past. He's running from something. He's afraid of something. He is ashamed of something. And we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is that has wounded him. And Galadriel takes him not quite against his will, right? Uh, he does make a choice. But she strongly maneuvers him, right, into coming with her. And she's going to bring him towards facing that past and healing that wound, which looked like it might possibly have been happening in episode six before the mountain blew up. Um, so it, it was interesting to me how the shape of that little encounter with Halbrand at the end of that episode um, did seem to kind of map onto. It was almost like we got a little recap of their whole story in order to um, have that sort of fresh in our minds as we then go into whatever we're going to see in episode eight. So death and mortality came up in several different contexts during this episode. I'm going to have a good bit to say still about the whole question of elvish mortality and the fading of the elves and Elrond's appeal to King Durin and all that stuff. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. For now, I just want to briefly emphasize what King Durin says about dwarves and mortality, because I thought that this was really interesting and really captures a lot of the core terms of this whole theme and this entire concept, which is a thread now which runs between the dwarves and the elves and also the men of Numenor as well. So um, when... King Durin is talking to Prince Durin after Elrond's appeal. He says that when Aule made the dwarves, he made them of two different elements, of fire and rock. 
and he associates two different things with these two different elements. Rock, he says, hungers for the eternal, resisting the pull of time, right? So that is the, that is the, their, their, this inclination towards permanence is there in the hearts of the dwarves. It's part of how they are made up, right? That, I think, is a really important thing because that desire for permanence, that desire for the eternal is, well, it's what is going to cause the problem. We know for the Numenorians down the road, it's going to be a major factor for them. And, of course, that's also the question that is driving the elves right now, too, right? Their own hunger for the eternal is, as far as they know, being threatened, right? Okay, so... But he goes on to say fire, right? So that's what rock does. But fire, he says, embraces truth. And the truth that he cites is that all things must one day be consumed, must one day be consumed and fade away to ash. That is the truth, he says. So these two elements, rock and fire, that permanence and desire for permanence and unchanging eternal life is one part of it. But the other part of it, which works together and is blended together with the rock, is the fire which embraces truth that all things are going to be consumed. Change, right? And not just change like transformation from one thing to another, but decline, wearing, that eventually everything is going to fade and to die and to diminish. This, King Durin says, is what it is like to be a dwarf, what it is like to be alive in Middle-earth. And he speaks of acceptance of this, that they have to reconcile themselves, not just ignore the fireside and stick to the rock, right? To, 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 to follow the appeal of the rock. Instead, they have to achieve acceptance, an, an acceptance of their eventual dwindling, that they will fade and that nothing will be left in the end. Prince Durin is highly resistant to this. I wanted to point this out because King Durin as far as I can see, is completely correct. King Durin is speaking a hard truth here, which, from what I am hearing, resonates exactly with what we see going on in Tolkien's Middle-earth. The idea of the continual decline, that things are fading and changing and are eventually going to die, there will be a new song, there will be a new creation down the road, but everything is always diminishing and fading in Tolkien's world. I think that King Durin is exactly right. And the kind of acceptance that he is urging on his son is precisely the thing which stands in contrast to those out-of-control desires which ended up causing the destruction of Numenor in Tolkien's world and which we can also see at play even among the elves in the Rings of Power show with what we've seen so far. I really wanted to highlight that moment because I think that we are hearing some tough truth and tough love from King Durin right there. In earlier episodes, we saw Elrond really struggling with his own legacy, or rather struggling with the idea, you know, the idea of whether or not he was worthy of his father's legacy. He told the story of Eärendil and how Eärendil, on his own, went across the sea in order to beg the Valar for help and assistance, that they would come and rescue the elves and men of Middle-earth from the oppression of Morgoth, who was stomping on them at the time, had been stomping on them for quite some time at that point, right? So Eärendil is, this is what made Eärendil a heroic figure, why he is now elevated among the stars, and Elrond was feeling earlier on the weight of that responsibility, uh, wondering whether or not he was a disappointment to his father, whether he would live up to that legacy. And I think it's very important that in episode seven, we see him performing an action which is directly parallel to that which his father did. He is kneeling at the feet of King Durin, and he is intervening on behalf of the elves, right? This is an act of intercession, just like 
Arendel's intercession in front of the Valar, begging for the assistance that will save the lives of his people. So we can see Elrond self-consciously following the legacy of his father in that moment. And what's more, in that moment, he embraces the identity of being half-elven. He names himself half-elven and says that he is no common elf argues, right, or claims that he has a unique perspective that is different from the perspective of other elves. Arendel spoke for both elves and men because he was himself half-elven as well. He was, he had a, a, a human father and an elf mother, and so he was able to speak on behalf of both peoples in front of the Valar. Elrond also is claiming that sort of unique perspective. I am not just an elf. The king had just talked about knowing whether or not he could trust the words of an elf, and Elrond says, you needn't, right? You know, you shouldn't necessarily trust everything an elf says, but you can trust me, because I am not just speaking as an elf. I am Elrond half-elven, and he invokes the sort of mantle of his father there, which was really, really interesting. So I loved seeing Elrond stepping into that role. Elrond seemed to be making a significant move forward in understanding himself and understanding his role. That was all really good. Here's the bad part. You may remember that Celebrimbor, in episode 5, was pushing him directly to do this in order to emulate his father. Remember, Celebrimbor told the story of before, how he knew Eärendil, before Eärendil left on his great journey, uh, the, the discussion that Eärendil had had uh, with, with, uh, with Elwing, Eärendil's wife, Elrond's mom, um, and, and he was saying how Eärendil was saying that he was the only one who could do this, right? And Celebrimbor was telling this story clearly to motivate Elrond to undertake the same thing, to feel also that he alone is in the position to intercede with the dwarves in this way and to accomplish the salvation of his people as his father Eärendil accomplished the salvation of his people. However, I think that Celebrimbor is wrong. Uh, I don't necessarily doubt his story about Eärendil. I don't think myself that Celebrimbor is quite so untrustworthy as that yet. I believe that Celebrimbor is deceived. I don't believe that Celebrimbor is himself a master manipulator uh, that is deliberately lying to people in order to get them to you know, serve his own ends. Um, however, the, that connection with Celebrimbor made me a little bit uncomfortable. Although I loved that scene and that moment with Elrond acting in the role of Eärendil and taking up that mantle, Celebrimbor's setup for that made me a little bit uncomfortable uncomfortable with it. And indeed, I still think that Elrond is himself mistaken. I think there's an irony there, that he is interceding for his people, and I don't think that his people need intercession in the same way. Eärendil interceded so that the elves and humans might be freed from the oppression of Morgoth. I think, I rather suspect anyway, if Elrond were to have gotten his way, then he would not be uh, the result of his intercession would not be to counteract the work of the enemy, but indeed to further the work of the enemy. So we'll see how that plays out. But the second thing, of course, is Durin himself. Both Elrond and Durin are dealing with the legacy from their fathers in this episode. Uh, Durin says to Elrond in a moment which is clearly a very powerful idea, expressing a very powerful idea for him. He says, the mightiest thing a dwarf can do is to be worthy of the name of his father. Right? Durin, Prince Durin does not want to reject his father, does not want to turn away from his father and denounce his father. He does. He gets frustrated with his father, and we've seen him, we, see, we saw him blew up, right? Uh, he, we saw how he blew up in response to his father back in, in episode five, and we saw him uh, burst out and call his father uh, unworthy of his crown, right? That, he was, uh, that he, was, he was polluting the crown, right? So we know he has got issues with his father, but at the same time, Durin feels very strongly the weight of legacy because it's not just about him and his father. And as his father told him in, back in episode three, I think it was, um, all of the, the, the spirits of the earlier dwarf kings, uh, you know, come to you and are with you. When, you, when a dwarf puts on uh, the crown of the dwarves, right? So there is this actual presence of 
the, of, of your father and his father and his father before that, all of the Durins back to the great and legendary figure of Durin the Deathless himself. Um, these are all, uh, all of this weight, Prince Durin feels on his shoulders to prove himself worthy of all of the Durins. And there's a real conflict here. His, he has a vision, right? Both a vision for his people and for Khazad-dûm, and also a desire to help his friends and to help their allies. But both of those things are actually working against his father and leading him to disobey his father and then eventually, as we saw at the end of this episode, get disowned by his father. And that's a really big deal. So that tension in Prince Durin's character, um, is he going to, in fact, prove himself worthy? And what does that look like? Um, or is he going to go his own way and find worthiness, right? Find a worthy end as he considers it, even though it means breaking with his father completely. That's a very serious uh, tension, a very serious kind of internal controversy that's growing within Durin uh, and really comes to the surface in episode seven. The friendship between Durin and Elrond, come on, this is one of the coolest things about this show, right? Almost everybody I talk to agrees that this friendship is one of the most powerful, interesting elements of the entire show so far. I was just, just in a discussion with a bunch of people over the weekend who are all saying that we would love an entire spin-off series of nothing but uh, Durin and Elrond doing stuff together. It is so good. The depiction of this friendship is really powerful. Unfortunately, I think we also have to come to grips with the fact that it's also very, very dangerous. It is introducing a very serious means and ends problem for both of these characters, but especially for Prince Durin. What I mean by this, of course, is that whenever you see something, a good end, something that you want to achieve, which is really important and really desirable and wholesome and good and excellent, but the means to achieve that end are questionable or shaky, that never works out well in Tolkien's world. That is one of the biggest possible red flags in the world of Middle-earth. Uh, if you decide to subordinate the means to the ends, to say, well, it doesn't matter. Um, I know that this might be sketchy. I know I might be doing something, um, uh, something not advisable along the way, but it's for a good purpose. As soon as you start talking that way, that is the path that leads you to Saruman and Boromir and other people who, in the Lord of the Rings that we see, who struggle or have struggled with and end up falling, um, or almost falling. Boromir's case, I think he recovers, but, uh, but still. Um, this is the kind of question, right? Boromir wants great things for his people, for his country. All he has to do is take the ring from Frodo and he can make it happen, right? That's the red flag. That's the warning sign. With Durin and Elrond, Durin is completely, Prince Durin is totally blinded by his love for his friend. And his love for his friend is a great thing. And it's a good thing. But he is not, he does not listen to his father at all. And his father is speaking sense to him. I think that King Durin is right in almost everything that he says to Prince Durin. I think if there's one character in episode seven who is speaking truth almost all the time, uh, it's King Durin. And Prince Durin can't hear it at all because he's only thinking of his friend. Um, and that, I think, is setting him up for a serious problem. And I think that we can see at the end of the episode, we can see where this might lead, right? Uh, what are Disa and Durin going to be willing to do in order to achieve ruling the mountain, claiming the mithril for themselves, right? When Disa says, when she lays claim to the mithril for them personally, right? Not just for the dwarves, but for Disa and Durin personally, 
that's a really bad sign, which even has echoes of the oath of Feanor itself, claiming the Silmarils uh, for himself, which led to a whole lot of problems down the road. Um, that direction of thinking that Disa and Durin himself both are um, where they're headed at the end, and a, again, a lot of it comes down to, a lot of it has its roots in this friendship between Durin and Elrond. Um, it's very interesting how that is being made the end, which seems to be tempting Durin to employ very, some very questionable means. And I'm going to be looking forward with some concern as to how that works out. My hope, by the way, is that Elrond himself will see this and may be able to help his friend to understand the difficulties that he's getting himself into. We'll see how that works out. But the Harfoot plotline is where we see, is that it's really one of the hearts of the friendship theme, I think. Um, I want to make a, a brief note about Nori and Poppy. Nori and Poppy's friendship is so constant and so excellent that you barely even notice it, right? Um, but I just wanted to draw attention to it for a moment. First, notice the confidence that they have in each other. It's clear that Nori has already told Poppy before episode seven about the scary incident with the freezing hand. Right? Poppy knows about it. I don't think anybody else does. I don't think that Nori has told Marigold or Largo or anybody else, but she's clearly told Poppy. Poppy, and Poppy understands Nori perfectly. When Nori is put on the spot and asked to help, uh, to ask the stranger to intervene, Nori doesn't know what to say, and Poppy immediately comes to her assistance and supports her. Just as Poppy immediately comes to her assistance again when Nori has her change of heart at the end of the episode and is planning to go away. We saw Poppy trying to urge Nori against helping the stranger, against doing the dangerous and risky and unusual thing at the beginning of the show, right back in episode two especially. Now, Poppy is completely on board. We see the, the, the extent to which her friendship with Nori really trumps those other things. And given what we learned about Poppy and Poppy's family, back in, I think it was episode four, uh, when we discovered that Poppy is an orphan who has been apparently um, adopted, in, uh, or, you know, quasi-adopted at least, into the Brandyfoot family. Um, the way that Poppy and Nori are clearly as close as sisters, just as Durin and Elrond. You know, Durin, in wanting to share his secret name, was treating Elrond like a brother. So we see Poppy and Nori in that sibling relationship as well, uh, the two sisters who are clearly prepared to stick to each other through thick and thin. But Nori's friendship with the stranger is, I think, in the bigger picture, though I, I don't ever want to take Nori and Poppy's friendship for granted because it's awesome. I think that Nori and the stranger's relationship is the one that's more significant, right? We see Nori's fear at the beginning. She's motivated by fear. She's terrified by what happened to her and this sense, her concern. She was quick to tell the stranger, you're not a peril, you're good. But was she right, right? She begins to doubt after that very scary experience with the frost or ice or whatever it was. And we see her fear continue when she's almost uh, uh, crushed by the falling branch that breaks off the tree that the stranger is in the middle of attempting to heal, though not instantly, of course. However, I wanted to point out a couple things. Uh, first, notice that even when she is still in that place of fear, when she still not, is no longer willing to trust the stranger, and this leads her to a, some really broad doubts that we'll talk about a little bit later, there's still that moment where she gives him the apple, and that's a very significant moment, I think, and that tells us a lot about Nori. Um, not only do we get that wonderful focus on it, I love the image of her little hand with the big apple in it, holding it out, and the stranger taking the apple in his, you know, reaching out his hand um, and, and taking the apple in his hand. Um, that's a beautiful image, and it's the more important. One thing I think it's, I think I, I overlooked the first couple times I watched this episode. That apple that she gave away was very precious. The grove has been largely trashed by the fires that burnt it before they got there. They have very little food. They came here expecting to find great quantities of food to supply them for the whole next season, and they find most of it destroyed, right? You may remember that when Nori wakes up from her sleep and finds Poppy eating an apple, she chides her, 
right? Uh, thinking that she's wasting food. There's, there's not enough to spare. We have to, we have to be very, very careful with the food to make it stretch out. And yet, despite the fact that the food that they have is very precious, she gives that apple to the stranger long before they knew that there were going to be plenty of apples in the end. So Nori is, is generous. Her, her friendship for the stranger, she, she, it, it's an act not quite of forgiveness. She hasn't changed her mind completely, and yet she's not going to distance herself completely either. Uh, she wants to provide him. She, she does think it best for him to go at that point, right? That is still where her fear is guiding her at the conclusion to which her fear has brought her. And yet, even in that place, she's not willing to just turn her back on him, just as she brought him snails in the first place, right? Which is what that other place that they had migrated to was famous for, was its snails, right? Now that they've come to the grove where the apples grow, she now gives him the apple. So the, the, the parallel of those two things, feeding him snails and now feeding him the apple, shows her care, that she's not willing to totally give up on him. Now, after Largo's speech about what Harfoots do best, right, what is characteristic about Harfoots is that they stay true to each other, he says. And that's what, it's right after that that Nori is inspired to have her change of heart, to choose friendship over fear. Remember, fear and faith were the two things that Galadriel was poising against each other in her conversation with Muriel back in episode four, right? Are you going to follow faith or are you going to follow fear? Nori was facing a similar question, right, of fear, which was in fact guiding her and led her to let the stranger go, or faith. Are you going to believe, despite perhaps some appearances, um, are you going to believe in him, believe, stay true to the idea that you had, and stay true to him, stay true to your friend? The friendship was acknowledged between the two of them. They've both been helping each, each other. And she chooses to stay true to him and not to leave him behind, which is deviant from their social perspective, right? The Harfoots have to protect each other. They have to stay together. They can't afford to be caught out of season in the wrong place where they won't have food and they'll all die. They are living in a rough environment and they can't just provide for themselves. The leaving behind, a lot of people have felt that that's really harsh. Honestly, I think that's a very naive thing to say. I mean, it is harsh, but I think it's naive to call it evil or wrong. Uh, the realities of life for a primitive culture like that, it's, it's tough when they are trying to survive and they have to do difficult things to survive. It's clear that uh, they don't like to leave people behind, but that is something that they feel that they have to do. And now Nori says, we're not going to leave him behind. She knows he's in danger, right? The creepy cultists, which we'll talk about later, uh, are pursuing him, apparently, and she knows that now. So she's not going to leave him behind. She's going to leave, even if it means leaving the rest of her people, which, of course, doesn't happen because they do stay true to each other. And we have this fellowship of Harfoots, which is going to go off in pursuit of the stranger at the end. But Nori's final choice of faith, of friendship, over fear, I think is a critical turning point for Nori's character and for the entire Harfoot plotline. Galadriel has been at the heart of the light and darkness theme from the beginning. And I've been watching this play out and I've been waiting for a moment. And I have to admit, I've not been entirely sure how I would know when the moment came. The moment I've been waiting for is when she touches the darkness. Finrod told her in episode one, this was the answer to her question. How can you tell the difference between the apparent light, which is a deception, and the true light? How do you know which light to go towards? And his answer was, sometimes you have to touch the darkness before you know. And so I've been asking myself, how will we know? when she's touched the darkness, because you could say arguably she's touched the darkness a few times. I rather thought she was touching the darkness uh, pretty closely when she was in that barn with Adar. Not that he was the darkness that she was touching, but the darkness in herself was coming out pretty strongly. That looked like her lowest point, certainly was her lowest point to, to then. I had said Goadriel seems heading towards a crash. 
that looked like the crash, and I didn't know where we were going to go from that. Well, that scene at the end of episode six, which we spent a good deal of time talking about, that moment of Galadriel just staring blankly off into the distance as the black cloud rolls over her and the ashes, I feel pretty confident that that was her touching the darkness. Um, and we see a visible change wash over her, right? As she aw awakes in this episode, covered in ash and surrounded by fire and darkness. Galadriel, I believe, has now touched the darkness because what has happened in episode seven? This was, although it was not intense or exciting in the ways that the events of episode six were, the speeches of Galadriel in this episode I found very remarkable and really exciting. Galadriel seems to have turned a corner. The things that she says in this episode, see, and, and also does, seem directly connected back to all of the struggles that she's had and all of the darkness that she's been enmeshed in to this point. Um, and almost all of this comes I really, actually, I think all of it uh, comes in her conversations with Theo as they are going together through the dark Mordor countryside. Um, we see that she has a whole new self-awareness, a whole new self-realization. One of the first clues that we get of this is when Theo tells her, it isn't your fault, and she says, yes, it is. I'm not sure what she means by that, in what sense she believes that the eruption of Mount Doom was her fault. Theo, of course, is later going to correct her and say that it was his fault. Now, that's an easy argument to see. He was the one that gave the hilt to Adar, that in, in, empowered him to uh, set off the, uh, the eruption. So, sure, you can see how Theo would blame himself for that, right? That makes a certain amount of sense. In what sense is Goadriel taking the blame for this? It's a little bit less clear. But I couldn't help but remember what Gilgalad was saying about... Galadriel and how when someone like Galadriel will not let go of the darkness that sometimes it makes the darkness spread. Um, perhaps Galadriel is seeing some wisdom herself in that idea. Um, and I haven't yet made up my mind about the sense in which this is true. I'm kind of waiting for some more data before I draw conclusions about Galadriel's uh, blame, taking the blame uh, for this. Um, but it was a very interesting moment. She then, again, showing more self-awareness, begins to talk with Theo about uh, killing orcs. He's asking her, how many orcs has she killed? And she says that she's killed many, though first she recalls that when she was his age, there was no such thing as orcs. The first thing she does in response to his discussing orcs is to recall for him a time when there were no orcs. Orcs are not an, in an inevitable thing in her world. And, but then Theo says, but, but you've, you know, you've, you've, how many have you killed since then? And she says, many. And he says, good. And she rebukes him for calling that good. This is the, the Galadriel, by the way, who has sworn to kill all the orcs, right, and save Adar for last in the previous episode. Back in episode two on the raft with Halbrand, uh, she was talking about going back and hunting down all the orcs, which prompted Halbrand to characterize her as wanting to murder the orcs, right? That was a a very pointed phrase uh, that Halbrand used back then, um, all of which really pointed to this unwholesome pleasure in killing orcs that she had. She was fixated on that. And now she's backed off from that. She says to Theo when he calls killing orcs good, she says it darkens the heart to call dark deeds good. It gives place for evil to thrive inside us when we do that, right? So when, when you call dark deeds, so killing orcs, is now a dark deed to Galadriel. How different is that from the end of episode six in that conversation with Adar, right? She seems to see things quite differently now. Um, she calls that a dark deed and that it gives place for evil to thrive within us, which clearly it has done. This may recall her confession in episode five, um, in that mutual confession scene with Halbrand in the forge, when she says that, um, that Gilgalad, Elrond, her own soldiers, couldn't tell the difference between her and the evil that she was fighting. And she has this self-awareness and tells him that every war is fought both without and within. 
and every soldier needs to be aware of this. If this is not Galadriel talking to her past self, I don't know what is, right? That is absolutely uh, the struggle that she herself was having. Um, but of course, it, it, it goes on. She's urging Theo to not take the burden of this day upon his shoulders, telling him that he might find it difficult to put it down again if he does. Um, and of course, that is exactly what we have seen her doing. She absolutely does. Having taken her brother's oath, as she believes, right, upon herself, as she explained back in episode one, the responsibility to hunt down Sauron. Nobody will do it if she doesn't. She is the only one, right? She was that, um, uh, that lone figure standing against the darkness, which is good and noble, but also was taking the burden of the darkness, the burden of the enemy upon her shoulders. And Theo asks her, how do you let it go? How do you let it go? The richness of Theo asking that question, like you're asking Galadriel how you let go of this, right? She's the one, that's what she's needed to know all the way through. And she gives an answer. And her answer is Estelle, is hope. She gives the hopeful answer. She sees what Gilgalad himself was not seeing because Gilgalad was not arguing from a position of Estelle when he was talking about hope. What she says, she says there are powers beyond the darkness at work in the world. And in days such as this, there may be little choice but to trust to their designs. And Theo pushes back against that. My home is gone. Where's the design in that, he says. And she says, I do not yet see it. But that's where faith comes in. That's where hope comes in. That there are powers in this world beyond the darkness. Theo doesn't recognize it, but that is a direct echo of the statement of Estelle that Bronwyn said to Theo, that Theo himself recalled and was asking her to say again what she used to say to him in the darkness when he was a kid, right? Which turns out to be what Sam Gamgee, of course, is going to be thinking to himself in The Lord of the Rings, that in the end, the shadow is but a small and passing thing, and that there is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Galadriel comes back to that. Galadriel, having touched the darkness, is now seeing the light, the light that is shining above the darkness, beyond the, sh the small and passing thing, which is the shadow, the very recognition that the shadow itself and all of the very real suffering that is currently surrounding them, the dead land, the destroyed village. She doesn't know whether everybody Theo knows, all, you know, his mother, Arondir, everybody else he cares about might be gone now, right? And yet she is arguing Estelle to him. She is seeing the light and moving towards the light. She has touched the darkness. And then what does she do with Theo in that very scene? She gives him her sword. What a big deal that is. She didn't, remember he asked her, how do you let it go? She couldn't let it go before. When Halbrand asked her why she's, she keeps fighting in episode five, remember she said, because I don't know how to stop. I can't stop. Elrond asked her to lay down her sword in episode one. And she said, I can't. I don't know who I would be or what I would do without it. And now she has laid aside her sword. She gives it to Theo. Um, this is so huge. What we see Galadriel doing, where we see Galadriel, almost everything she says in this episode shows that she is now having woken up covered by ash in a completely different spiritual and emotional place than she was, than she has been for the entire show to this point. It rather seems as if the eruption of Mount Doom is going to be a turning point in Galadriel's career. Brief side note before I move on to my last point. Theo, of course, was connected with that dark hilt, the Morgul hilt, uh, which drank his own blood and uh, built its blade of, of shadow and flame, right? That was, there was nothing that was good about that, right? Notice that Theo has lost the hilt now, but it has been exchanged for Galadriel's sword. And that final image of him at the end of the episode, holding up, Galadriel's sword and shouting strength to the Southlands and the close-up that we get from behind on Theo's hand holding Galadriel's sword up over his head. That seems like a good thing. 
I still am a little bit concerned about Theo's long-term trajectory, though his arrow is certainly pointing up now a little bit. So I'm not sure exactly what that replacement is going to mean in the long run, but in the short term, it certainly seems like it's got to be a good thing. Now, one last light and darkness note, um, because I have to talk about the mithril in this context, because we talked about uh, the mithril and the the song of the roots of the Hephaeglir back in episode five in the light and darkness context. And so I think it's important just to take a brief glance at that. Again, more on the mithril and what it all means and how it fits with the elves. But notice what we do see in this episode are those veins of light, right? The veins of the glowing mithril extending down into the darkness. Um, the, I still, um, I, I, I was saying before in episode five that I felt that the visual metaphor we were getting in that, uh, uh, that sort of uh, 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 visual representation of the roots of the song, of, 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 of the Hithaiguir, the tree and the roots extending down and everything looked almost like a literalization of the light down below that was leading into darkness, that was leading into folly, that was a sinking rock rather than, uh, rather than the light that was, you know, leading you on like a ship to sail into the, into the light, into the west. Well, that seems to have been, uh, we, we seem, I think, to get that same impression here in episode seven when we actually find the veins, which look very like that picture, extending down into darkness. And of course, we follow them down as the leaf flutters down at the end of the episode. And we do see that at the roots of all of those veins of Mithril is darkness, is shadow, right? Again, with that downward movement, which has always been, the light and darkness theme has always been correlated with that upward versus downward movement as the leaf of the elves descends and descends and descends down, fluttering down into the darkness. It meets the shadow and flame of the Balrog. And that certainly seems to be where these shiny veins of Mithril lead. So if I was a little bit concerned that this whole Mithril story seemed to be pointing in a dangerous and downward direction, not only physically, but spiritually downward direction, the very end of episode seven, really seem to confirm that. So I suspect that the fate theme is going to come much more prominently into play in episode eight. But for now, I just wanted to mention one thing that I couldn't let go by without talking about it a bit from episode seven. And that is the little prophecy that King Durin makes about Prince Durin. When he's recalling uh, Prince Durin is a baby, right? And then he talks about that vision that he had um, of the baby with a beard, right? And so he was therefore took this to mean that his son was going to thrive and they wouldn't have to worry that his son was going to die. Um, but then he goes on to say that his son would move mountains. And as soon as he said that, that had the weight of prophecy in my ears when I was listening to it. I don't know exactly what that means, um, but I think we have heard another prophecy which is likely to come true in some way or other, and I rather suspect it's not going to be in a very pleasant way, but we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's more than one sense in which Prince Durin is going to move mountains. Um, and I hope for his sake, because I love the character of Prince Durin, um, that it will be so. But in any case, I will certainly be paying attention to how that prophecy that Prince Durin is going to move mountains is going to come true. Episode 7 is called The Eye, and as usual, this title applies at more than one level. We have physical eyes and vision, which come up several times during the episode. We have several people whose more metaphorical vision of the future and of the path and where they're headed really comes into focus during Episode 7. There's a sense in which this episode serves as an eye, like an eye of the storm, between the excitement and explosions of Episode 6 and whatever is going to happen in episode eight. And of course, we're in Mordor for most of this episode, 
Uh, and, and now that we have Mordor and Mount Doom exploding, you have this looming concept, right, of the Eye of Sauron. Um, is the Eye of Sauron in some sense opening somewhere here now that Mordor, his future center of power, is now established? Well, Galadriel begins this episode, right? We start with that close-up view of her eye and her opening her eye. Um, her eye upside down and then us beginning to see her face and her body, right, and all of Galadriel as she sits up. Um, I love the way in which she's completely covered with ash. It makes her eyeball itself when she opens her eye. Her eye looks so clear in contrast to all of the ash and dirt around it. And that seems like such a wonderful image for the Galadriel that we get in episode seven. In, in episode seven. Her eye is now open in a way that it has never been before, I think. I've talked about Galadriel a good bit already when talking about light and darkness, but I will just mention or, or recall one thing that I talked about there. When she was asked by Theo to explain how is it that, you know, if we're supposed to trust to the designs of those other powers beyond the darkness who are at work here, um, how, is it, how is it according to that design that my home should be destroyed? She says that she cannot see the answers yet, right? And it's her expression of her lack of vision, that metaphorical vision for the future. She doesn't see, she doesn't know the answers. She can't understand it. But instead of being driven uh, to sort of desperation and vengeance and taking things into her own hands, now she responds to that in faith, which I think is really interesting and really important here. Now, Durin is another place. In the Durin and, and Elrond plot, we have sort of the centerpiece of that story being the little peephole, right, that Durin opens up in the wall, which leads to the mithril chamber, right? That little window out onto those enormous loads of mithril, the veins of mithril going down the inside of the mountain and extending down, which we know, but they do not, down to the Balrog. Um, as I say, that's really kind of the center image, I think, uh, of that whole thing. Durin's face peeping through that little window is like a, 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 an almost, almost like a literalization of Durin's like, vision for the future, right? When he looks into the future of Khazad Dum, what he's hoping to do with and for his people, it's all about all of that mithril. So him looking through that window and seeing the mithril is like finally seeing with his physical eyes what he's been seeing, right? With his metaphorical eyes, right, uh, for all, all along. Um, but of course, he's not the only one with a vision. We see he's looking through that. We see Elrond's face looking through that window. And then finally we see King Durin's face looking through that window. And he, of course, rejects it. And one of the last lines of the episode is him telling, uh, instructing people to seal it up, right? Let's close that peephole. Disa, however, in her last scene with Prince Durin, expresses her vision for the, for the future. That kind of unsettling future of ambition and dominance that she describes, which is a little bit uneasy, right? She doesn't have a physical vision, she has a metaphorical vision, though of course, it's hard to avoid Disa's eyes in that scene. Um, Disa's eyes have always been different, right? Have always been a, this, that, that odd color. But nowhere have it's, has it seemed to me that the color of Disa's eyes jumps out more significantly than in that final scene when she was describing her aggressive, ambitious vision of the future. Now, Nori, I've talked about Nori's vision a little bit too, but I wanted to emphasize it in this context. We saw her doubt her vision, her vision, her sense of where she, she was supposed to go, her sense of calling into this destiny, right? Whatever it is, whatever, she doesn't know exactly what it is that she's been called to, but she doubts that and thinks that she's maybe just a Harfoot just a Harfoot, supposed to be conforming with their society instead of breaking from it, instead of potentially enriching it, right? Uh, uh, finding new things and discovering new things and fulfilling whatever the calling is that led her and the stranger to meet in the way that they did. But of course, she ends the episode when she decides to go and set out to go and help and to warn the stranger. Um, she has a new conviction that she now brings uh, to this. She has, uh, once again, her vision, it's still not clear. She still doesn't see the future. She still doesn't know exactly what it is that she's supposed to do. All that she knows is that now her friend is alone and 
Harfoots stick together. So ironically, she's going to separate from the other Harfoots in order to stick with her friend because she is certain now that that is the calling that she should be answering, the thing that she is supposed to be doing. So her vision for her path, the immediate path in front of her anyway, is now clear at the end of episode seven. And I cannot wait to see what hints we get about how that vision might become clearer. I talked about this with, connection, with regard to the stranger and his role, and I, I hope that with that we will also be getting some clearer sense, some clearer vision for us of where Nori's calling is likely to take her. Finally, there is Queen Muriel. Now, the story of Queen Muriel in Episode 7 is one of the places where we see the theme of physical eyesight coming most clearly into play. Muriel's blindness is, of course, a powerful fulfillment of her father's prophecy. She is blinded, of course, doing a good thing. The coming to Middle-earth was motivated, right, by good intentions. Uh, her heroism in going into the burning building uh, to bring out children, right, was clearly a good thing to do. This was the queen regent putting herself in harm's way, putting herself into danger in order to save the lives of the Southlanders. It's a great thing. But in the course of that, she is stricken blind um, when the fire explodes into her face. And of course, we cannot help but remember at this point her father's prophecy. Tar Palantir said that in Middle-earth she would find nothing but darkness. And of course, that prophecy has now come true. And we are presented at the end of the episode with this remarkable sight, right? We have Queen Muriel sitting there staring off into the horizon with her blindfold on, right? And so we have the blind Queen Muriel, daughter of Tar Palantir, whose name means the farsighted, right? So the way in which she is now reversing the role of her father. She was trying to fulfill, to bring to accomplishment what her father had attempted to do, but failed to do during his rule. And now, instead of being the farsighted one, she is now the blinded one. And I can't wait to see how that is going to play itself out in Numenor. Now, she swears to Galadriel an oath near the end of the episode. She says to Galadriel that Galadriel should save her pity for their enemies. And she swears an oath that she is going to return uh, with more armies, right? She's, she's going to come to finish what she started and destroy the enemy that did this to them. Um, and that is... Well, it's a distressing kind of oath, right? Having been warned against going to Middle-earth by her father and then having had his warning and prophecy come true, she is doubling down on this. And there is one element of her prophecy, uh, not of her prophecy, there's one element of her oath that is particularly unsettling, and that is the name she calls herself. She calls herself Miriel, daughter of Ar Inzildun. Now, that is her father's name. The kings at this stage in the history of Numenor are taking their names in the Adonaic tongue. Tar Palantir is Quenya. That's his elvish name. But normally, of course, because of the current anti-elvish policies of Numenor, the kings do not anymore take their names, usually, in the elvish language. Tar Palantir was deliberately returning to the Elvish languages and taking that as his name, but he did have a name in Adunayak, and his name is Ar Inzildun, and that is the name by, she names him by his Adunayak name, not by his Elvish name. He is never gone by Ar Inzildun. So uh, that she names him that way, which is the way of the Kingsmen, the way of the mainstream of Numenor that we've seen, it's almost like she is aligning herself in more of a, well, Pharaohonian kind of way um, as she is setting up this oath. It, it gives the oath a very ominous sense that in fulfilling that oath, she is going to be departing from the wisdom of her father and the goals of her father. I have a feeling that Muriel's oath is not going to turn out to be a very good thing. Now, meanwhile, 
I've been looking all around for Sauron in this episode, and I don't see him anywhere. So even though the, it was called the Eye, and I was expecting the Eye of Sauron to become relevant, it never really seemed to do that. I don't know why I couldn't see it, but I think that um, we, we certainly the expectation of it uh, was being built, that we were waiting for the Eye, we were waiting for Sauron to be revealed. So in part, I think, um, the fact that this episode was called The Eye, in which we did not see Sauron yet, I think is also partly an anticipation for the next episode to come. Episode seven, guys. We're, we're really in it now. Uh, some serious stuff hit the fan. And uh, we saw Corey hide under tables and lots of Dutch angles. So <laughs> looking forward to this week um, and digging into some bits. A couple of things for this week. One, I'm going to open with just some camera angles. Um, we're just going to talk about how that is a storytelling device um, and how it works um, in some of these scenes. Uh, then I want to take a look at the conversation between the Durans. Uh, that is really beautifully shot and reveals a lot of lore and storytelling all through angles, in addition to what's being said by the characters themselves. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up with a couple of questions that I had on Twitter um, about comparisons to the Peter Jackson trilogy. So, firstly, this opening shot. Incredible. First of all, I'm so glad that we got to actually see what happened because that final closing scene of episode six with Galadriel just standing there willing whatever was going to come to come. I, I don't know if it was PTSD or if it was a challenge or resignation. I don't know, but I'm so glad we opened on that scene as well um, because it gave us that continuity. We keep talking about pacing in Other Minds and Hands and the Twitter show and questions on Twitter and things. Um, we keep talking about pacing, and I do think that's one of the things that the series is struggling with. I'm questioning whether it should have been released two episodes at a time or the whole season dumped all at once, so we got it like one big overarching. I don't know. We can't decide that. The decision's been made. You never know if it's going to be better or worse a different way seeing it um, than how you saw it. Uh, but pacing-wise, I do think there are just a few struggles. So I was really glad to see this kind of continuity that I don't have to wait an entire episode to find out what happens um, to the Southlands um, when the creation of Mount Doom happens. So... This opening shot, first of all, we get oh, some satisfaction that we're, we're getting to see what happened um, and concern because our characters are potentially all roasted. Uh, so we need to see what happened. So this opening shot really loved the initial conception. The camera is upside down. You know, from the very, very beginning, we are as confused and as discombobulated as our characters are. It's upside down and the color palette is purely red and black. There's just nothing else. I mean, yeah, you can argue there's variations of red, like there's some orangey red and there's some whitey red and there's some gray black and things like that, but we really just have this two color palette for a very long time. Um, so starting with that inverted camera, we're upside down, we're not concerned, we're, we're not uh, centered in this world. What is going on? We have been thrown off our feet as well. When the camera does eventually right itself, things are still not right. The sound in this bit is so good. It, it sounds like you've got water in your ears, right? It's really muffled. Um, it's, it's not letting you take in the entirety of what's going on. Then when she does start to stand up, we get a lot of Dutch angles. <laughs> so that's everybody's new favorite buzzword. A lot of Dutch angles, but they keep swooping. There's no stability. Uh, it's very fuzzy in the background, which matches the fuzziness of her hearing. Um, there's no, there's no clarity. There's no reference points for us on the horizon. There's no buildings that are familiar. All we see is smoke and fire and red. Then we have that horse running across shot from left to right, from, uh, corner to corner. So unnerving, you know, that shouldn't happen. It is literally the stuff of nightmares. So when you're talking about, um, you know, Corey talking about Uden last uh, episode as, as hell, hi, <laughs> here we are, um, and no knowledge of who made it, if anyone made it. So then when Gladriel starts yelling out, Halbrand, Zildur, it's really the first time I think we see that kind of vulnerable human, I know she's an elf, but that kind of side of Galadriel, and it really started to set some foundations for me that we were going to see a different side of her this episode. That's probably the main thing I've heard about Galadriel. She's so angry all the time. 
I, I get that. I see that. I understand that. But she is really angry. And we also need a very strong arc for Gladriel. So she needs to kind of sit in this one note, singularly focused anger for a long time before an arc can take off because we need to see a massive transition in her character from beginning to end. So she is angry for a very long time. So we, we get a little bit of a hint of maybe she's going to change because she's just as panicked as we kind of all are. Where is everybody? Um, Story-wise, also really interesting when Theo comes out of the smoke first and seems to be unscathed and she asks, are you hurt? And he says, no. Then we see other people, so the, the mystery and the magic is kind of gone. But when he said, no, I'm fine, there was a real part of me that believed Corey's theory about Arendir being his father, um, because maybe it involves some sort of elf blood to keep you safe, uh, to keep you whole. We know that's not true because we saw many of the other villagers that are not elves um, that survived that. Uh, but that was a nice little moment of like, ooh. So the camera isn't solid and steady until the very end of this scene when she does meet Theo. Then we have a purpose and then we see Galadriel turn into almost a maternal, come with me, you know, let's let's get out of here and find our people. So that whole shot is just so shaking, you know? Oh, hello. Cameo from the dog. Um, that, that whole shot is just so engaging um, and revealing, setting us up for a new world that has gone topsy-turvy. Um, and and flipped us over on our head. We don't know what's going on, where we are. We can't hear anything. We can't see anything. It's terrifying, right? So we get this bit of just complete and utter discombobulation. We don't know which way is up. We don't know what's down. Uh, the world is on fire. We can't hear anything. We can't see anything. I don't know who's around me. So we're starting off episode seven very shaken um, and very uncertain of what's next. And I think that really worked with this episode, too, because throughout this episode, we see all of our leaders taking steps back. All of our leaders get a real hit in this episode. Uh, Mira loses her sight. Isildur loses his son. Uh, sorry, Elendil loses his son. Um, we lose Isildur. Uh, so everybody is at risk in this episode. Everybody has lost something and is taking a step back. And I feel like from the very beginning, we get that, oh, goodness, something is real different. So by the time the title is cheesily revealed at the end of the Shadowlands turning into, the Southlands turning into um, Mordor, and you're kind of like, yep, here we go. So yeah, really, really beautiful opening shot to kind of set the, the groundwork for what we're going to see in this episode. Okay, the next scene to take a look at uh, is about 40 minutes in, and it's the conversation between the two Durins. This scene has a lot in it. Um, I did ask Corey about the lore, so um, we'll, we'll get a, a summary from him. Um, but mostly, I, I imagine most of you know, there shouldn't be two Durins at the same time. And this was a very active decision by the showrunners to kind of go against the lore and present these two Durins in the same location. So I'm calling this the scene of the two Durins because it's just in such sharp relief that the two of them are occupying the same space and really having this struggle of leadership, um, the old versus the new, the cautious versus the adventurous, um, and just what that kind of age and, and dynamic, and also the father-son dynamic that's at play in this whole series as well, um, going into it. So, you know, firstly, just this opening shot, we open on a really beautiful, warm still of Durin the Younger, um, and he's just thoughtful. It's a slightly up angle, so looking slightly up at him, just thoughtful. You know, something's coming and he's quite pensive about it. The next shot we get is the most revealing. So we have the voice of Durin Sr. over top of it. Um, and as soon as his voice starts, we get this pan as if we're in the room and we're looking at them from afar. But what we see most occupying 90% of the screen is a magnifying glass and it turns Sr. Durin upside down. So we are looking through this lens at an inverted Durin. Think about what that could infer, you know? Like, I'm already unsettled. I'm not sure what to think about you. I'm turning you on your head, quite literally. So kind of go, ooh, uh, should I listen to you, my king? Should I? Um, you know, if, if we're putting ourselves in the position of the dwarves. Excuse me. It's, it's just a very thoughtful way to look at this. And we have a magnifying glass. So it's scrutiny, right? It's kind of looking at those um, flaws or strengths and really kind of examining this king. It continues to pan. 
they they come into sharper focus in the background. Um, so they are now the main focus and the stuff that was in the foreground that still takes up most of the screen because it's in front of us, takes up most of the frame, is now fuzzy. But we can see what else is on that table. There's a set of scales. So now we have a magnifying glass that is scrutinizing and we have a set of scales that is literally measuring your worth, right? So these kind of ideas of weighing, measuring, evaluating, judging, all of that is set up in the foreground of this scene as we pan from right to left, looking in on the two Durants having this conversation. The rest of this conversation uh, is mostly over the shoulder shots, which is pretty standard for a film conversation and medium shots. So you can kind of get close-ups, but not extreme close-up um, of their emotions. It does get tighter towards the end of the scene. But it's mostly this really thoughtful story from Darren Sr. about how he looked after his son and, you know, was worried about him when he was young and ill, but knew that he would be a great uh, dwarven king with a long gray beard. Uh, so we just get these over-the-shoulder shots um, with Durin in focus, Durin Younger in focus, and Durin Senior out of focus telling the story. Um, and then we start to get a few more of the close-ups. And most of them are slight up angles, which I find really interesting um, because that's supposed to be, you know, a show of, of strength. Um, or weakness depending on how the camera is tilted. If it's looking down, it's a bit weaker. You know, we're in a position of power looking down on them. So looking up ever so slightly puts them in a position of power, um, which makes sense. They're kings. Uh, so they are the rulers of this group. So a slight up angle works. Also quite nice because, you know, it, it doesn't make anything of the dwarves' height. It's purely stature um, and prominence and presence in the scene. So looking slightly up at them works really well. So as the scene continues on, um, we get a few more shots from various angles in the room, which I also quite like. They're not just doing a static, I'm the camera looking at them. The camera is everywhere around the room, which is also tricky to shoot. So that means they did this multiple times. Um, so they're moving the camera around. They're getting lots of different angles. Often it is Durin Younger in focus, but only taking up a third of the scene with Durin Senior out of focus, taking up the majority of the scene interesting dynamic. When it focuses on Duran Sr., you rarely see Duran Jr. in the frame at all. So it's just Duran Sr. in sharp focus. But when it's Duran Jr., you usually have Duran Sr. out of focus, Duran Jr. in focus, um, but taking up less of the scene. And Duran Jr. seems to get a bit feistier, a bit more intense. The angles start to skew ever so slightly um, on Duran Sr. It's not a Dutch angle, so I don't want to go quite that far, but it does start to tilt just a tiny bit to throw us a little bit off. Then we get this kind of confrontational, I am done with this, this is not the situation I wanted, you are not my son, you know, all these things that are just building, building, building. Duran Younger really charges. You can see the hurt in Duran Sr.'s face. And as he takes the helm off and throws it to the side, we can infer what that means. But then the next shot is Duran Sr. turning and walking away and is perfectly framed by the shaft, the mine shaft. And it's very reminiscent of the scene when Duran Jr. first went to speak to him. What was that, episode two? Episode one or two? Um, where he's sitting in the throne and he's perfectly framed by the... Um, the square room looking out over Casa Doom. So kind of returning to that perfect square frame, lining everything up, all of the lines are going straight to the center of the shot, perfectly squaring him in the middle. King, you know, I'm in charge. So the helm has been ripped off. He's all topsy-turvy. The focus doesn't really matter. The camera's not crazy, but it's just static watching this. But then we get that shot of Duran Sr. King, decision has been made my word, you know? So it just feels very, poof. so I thought that was a really powerful scene to give us some really interesting dynamics in the relationship, um, a fair bit of insight into the lore of, of how this, excuse me, difficult relationship does work and can work um, and how it's going to affect their life, their, their people um, as Dwarven Kings. Um, and just how the shots can tell that kind of vibe, that kind of story. The other thing I loved about this entire scene was the music. Um, so Barry Mercury's score is just lovely, and you can hear that dwarven theme throughout. Um, first, when you just have the shot of uh, Duran Sr., that theme begins before he kicks all around out. That theme begins, so you, you know, mm, you know, we're getting into some serious stuff. We've got the dwarven theme going on. The king is here. But those tones 
exist throughout this entire scene. So you just hear that kind of raw, you know, that, that chanting throughout the entire scene. And it's just very powerful. So it just moves all of this into this little power struggle between father and son and is, is beautifully shot. Okay, and the last thing I want to comment on is a couple of questions that I had on Twitter about the noticeable comparisons to Peter Jackson's trilogy and just my thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I could probably give a whole lecture if I really thought about this and kind of did some outlining, which if you want me to do, we can do that after the season ends. But my like immediate thoughts are, of course, it looks the same. Uh, they're using the same concept artists. So, you know, we've got John Howe there. Um, and he is heavily influenced by all of the things that came before, just as every other concept artist is. So, And we know from the showrunners that they want this to sit inside of a believable Middle Earth. The interpretation of that phrase is kind of interesting, because a believable Middle Earth, that is dependent upon what creates our definition of Middle Earth. If you are purely text then I think they're doing a really good job because they're they're mimicking what is described in the text really well. But very few of us are purely text. Um, that's definitely a big thing in adaptation theory about how language and visuals kind of tie together and how an image can replace the text in one's mind. Um, I definitely have fallen prey to that. Uh, there are certain things that, especially Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, that if you just mention, I immediately am picturing what I saw in the film and not necessarily what I originally imagined from the text and my own imagination. Um, so, you know, th that kind of difficulty is just innate in adaptation anyway. But with these adaptations, they want it to be in a believable Middle Earth they're using the same concept art. They're using familiar sounds. You know, the theme is by Howard Shore. Uh, I think Barry McCreary's score is incredible, but also very reminiscent of the music that we heard in a previous Middle Earth. So you kind of believe that it's of the same world. The things that are jarring to me, and I think jarring to some of you, are some of the matches that feel a bit convenient. Some of them I agree with and some of them I don't. So like one that um, was pointed out quite a bit was from this last episode where um, Theo and Galadriel are hiding beneath a tree and the orcs come in and it's so reminiscent of uh, the orcs seeking out Frodo and Sam and, and the hobbits as they're escaping back end. And absolutely, I can totally see that. It's really reminiscent of that. They're, they're sitting underneath the tree. They even have that bit about the smell. Um, but that is also from the Bakshi uh, adaptation. So like there's just this this really iconic image of our mind in our mind of hiding from orcs anyway, that it makes sense to have something kind of similar. Um, I agree, it's very familiar, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if we look at it and go, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. It is a bad thing if it looks if you look at it and it takes you out of the narrative. Um, I shouldn't say bad thing. It can be tricky to navigate because you want to just get lost in the story. But, you know, it's tough when we know this stuff so well that we end up looking at it and going, I'm very familiar with that. I've seen this before. Um, I don't really mind that one because it's just kind of a match of visuals. And that kind of reference to something that we're familiar with from Peter Jackson's trilogy is is lovely. It's kind of nice to be back in that world and, and, and have that familiarity. The things I'm finding a little bit trickier are just some of the setups they seem to be doing that feel a bit convenient. Um, the one I'm, I'm keenly looking for um, is the release of the, the horse. I was about to say Brago, but that's what Aragorn's horse is. I forget the name of Beric, right? Um, anyway, so they release his horse into the wild because, you know, he only answers to his, his master and we think his master is dead and obviously his horse is going to go find him and they're going to come riding back, you know, to save the day, right? I'm kind of already anticipating that. Well, that's pretty much exactly what happened with Aragorn and Brago. So, I don't know, that one feels a little too close to me to being like, this is exactly what happened. <laughs> and there was that moment, you know, where um, the Numenorean forces uh, arrived just at the right time to save everybody in the tavern. And that was very much like a first light look to the east. But again, these are just familiarities because we know this this world so well, the trilogy world so well. It's tricky that those are so in the forefront of our mind. I mean, it's a rescue scene. There's only so many ways you can do it. So regardless of what they show we're going to think about all the other rescue scenes that we know from Middle Earth as well. Um, and I think the trilogy is just sharper in our mind than most of the other adaptations. 
We've probably all watched The Hobbit, but probably not as many times as we watched Peter Jackson's trilogy and the Bakshi ones. Yeah, I, I don't go back to those often, I have to say. So um, having that familiarity, I think, is a real strength with this adaptation. They want it to fit inside of a Middle Earth that we are familiar with. It's just how to walk that line, right? So how close can you get to familiar without being copying or without being, you know, too reductive? Uh, so I look forward to where it's going, um, but I definitely clock what you guys are saying of this just looks familiar. This this looks like something we've seen before. So let's see where they take it. Um, but thanks for pointing that out. And, you know, we'll see what happens in episode eight and leading into seasons two, three, four, and five. Okay, so when Durin throws the mithril over next to where the corrupted leaf is sitting, the corrupted leaf is purified by the apparent influence and proximity of the mithril. A lot of people are asking, what does this mean? What does this tell us about all the stuff that we learned back in episode five? So let's go through that. What exactly do we know about this whole leaf situation. So there's a couple things that we need to remember. First, we need to recall that the tree in Linden has been corrupted, that that corruption was beginning some time ago, and that the idea was not that the mithril, the point of the mithril, of course, of the collecting of the mithril, was not to heal the tree, it was to heal the elves. There's some kind of link between the corruption of the tree and the diminishing of the elves, as far as gil understands and as far as Celebrimbor was explaining and that the light of the Silmaril is involved, of course, and sort of distilled into the Mithril. Now, I still don't really know exactly where I stand on the whole uh, Song of the Roots of the Hithyglir issue. I think it's still possible that that story is, apoc is apocryphal. I myself am still kind of connecting with Elrond's skeptical face on that point. But for the sake of the rest of this segment, I'm going to speak as if the link between the light of the Silmarils and the Mithril is totally accurate, right? I'm just, let's just roll with that because that I think is actually the least of the problems. And I think it's actually something a little bit distracting from the real issues I think that are at stake in this whole question about the diminishing of the elves. So let's think about the diminishing of the elves here. There are two issues that I think that we need to look at, two issues that seem to me most dubious about what we learned back in episode five. The first was simply the description of the diminishing, which actually Elrond gave to Prince Durin at the end of episode five. And you'll remember that what I said at the time was that that description was like 95% accurate. His description of how they would fade and diminish until they became like nothing and were only a memory for in the, of the races that came after. That's exactly how the, the diminishing of the elves work. The only, there was only one word which was different from the way that Tolkien described it. And that word was souls. Elrond said that their souls would diminish and eventually perish. Whereas in Tolkien's works, it's their bodies that diminish and perish. And that seemed to me a really significant difference. And it is what it has led to, the consequences of that shift, of that changed understanding, is much increased alarm, right? This is not just we shall fade and our time shall pass, this is, we're all gonna die, right? There's an urgency here. This is why in episode seven, we're hearing things like Prince Durin talking about his friend drowning and his father asking him to swat away his hand, right? He feels like he is saving the lives of his friend and of all of the rest of the elves, right? So it's, it's their very lives, their very existence that is at stake. That's the effect of that one little change in the concept of the, of the diminishing of the elves. And the question that I was raising is, where does that change come from? Is this part of the change that the show is asking us to accept? Is this just, this is just an alteration from the text that this adaptation is making? That's possible, but I'm still not really convinced that that's the case. Um, anyway, so that's one issue. The second issue is the question of the causal link between the corruption of the tree and the fading of the elves. This, that there is some kind of cause and effect link between those two things seems to be completely taken, well, I don't say taken for granted, but it certainly, that, that assumption certainly seems to underlie 
all of the argument that Gilgal makes. Why is it that he finds, why is he so alarmed about the diminishing of the elves? Why is he so convinced that it is imminent and that it is happening? It's because of the tree, right? So how exactly does that work? How are the tree and the elves, in fact, linked? Is there a cause and effect link between the two of them? That, and that could go in either way, right? You could say that there was a cause and effect link that if something bad happened to the tree, then something bad would happen to the elves. That seems pretty dubious, right? Um, instead, it would seem much more likely that the cause and effect would go the other way, that the tree would itself be causally linked as a sort of a sign, as a, as a sort of a, a symbol, an outward manifestation of the health of the elves, so that if the elves were diminishing, right, if they were all dying, then the tree would die too, right? So that, that the dying of the elves would cause the death of the tree. I think it's very unlikely that, like, the death of the tree by itself would cause the death of the elves. That, that seems kind of extreme, right? You better take real good care of the tree if that's the case, right? So, uh, so I, I, I doubt that. But the other one seems to be a possibility. Um, and it, in fact, it seems to be to be one of the things that gil is sort of implying, right? That it is like the fact that the tree is corrupted, the fact that the tree is near death, proves to gil that the elves must in fact be in trouble, must be themselves dying in this way, right? So I think that he does suggest that there is a cause and effect connection. Now, the mithril cleans the leaf, right? It cleanses the leaf. What exactly does that prove? Um, unless the cause and effect does in fact go the other way, right? Unless we're actually saying that the corruption of the tree is what is causing the the harm to the elves, right? The diminishment of the elves. Healing the tree, that's not by itself going to do anything. Remember that all we've seen on camera, all we saw in episode seven, was that the proximity of mithril did seem to heal the leaf. It does seem to act against whatever it is that is corrupting the tree. The question is, what exactly is corrupting the tree? Is the situation, the one that gil believes, seems to believe, right? That the corruption of the tree is a mere outward manifestation of the evil in the elves. And thus, if Mithril acts against the one, it will probably act against the other. That seems like a logical fallacy to me, but, but maybe. I'm willing to go along, let's imaginatively go along with this, right? But let's think about what this means. Let's think about what this means. What is their attitude towards the diminishing of the elves? The diminishing of the elves is treated by gil and by Celebrimbor as an unnatural event, something that's not supposed to happen, something like a disease or even like an attack on them, right? That, at least that's how it seems to me. Um, it does not seem that they're merely discontented with their lot that they know that elves are doomed to fade and die, but they really don't want to, right? I disbelieve that. That's not the tone of Gilgalad's, um, of Gilgalad's words, of how Gilgalad seems to be approaching this, nor does it fit with the picture of the corrupted tree and the rapid onset of that corruption that we get and that we see. Um, this seems to be Gilgalad's, Gilgalad's motivation, seems to be premised on the idea that something is wrong, right? There's, 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 there's something amiss in elfdom, and it needs to be fixed. It needs to be healed. They're sick and they need healing. It's broken and it needs repairing the state of the elves. That, I think, requires us to believe several things that I'm not sure that I do believe, right? Who could do that? Who, no one has the power to do that. Even Morgoth didn't have the power to do that. This is another reason why I disbelieve the entire thing. Because in order to, in order to buy it, should what gil says turn out to be true, it would mean that somebody has the power to make this happen to the elves. Um, and... Uh, again, in this sort of malicious, unnatural, diseased kind of way. And I don't see how that's... Could Sauron do that? I don't see how that's possible. Now, could Sauron poison the tree? Absolutely he could poison the tree. 
Could he poison the tree in such a way that the dark corruption that he spreads within the tree reacts to the presence of Mithril in this way? Yeah, that seems well within his capabilities and would seem to fit well within his apparent goals. That is, it seems that the acquisition of lots of Mithril seems to be part of the plan, doesn't it? And this certainly spurs that on as we see happening here in episode seven. Now, let's back up a second and let's think about Sauron's plans, big picture, right? So what do we know about Sauron's plans? Adar has told us in his testimony back in episode six that Sauron wants to heal Middle-earth, that he wants to bring order to Middle-earth. He wants to rule everything and set everything to rights, meaning make it follow his will, right? And do exactly as he wants it to do. In order to do this, he needs to somehow remove the resistance that the elves and the other free peoples of Middle-earth are likely to pose to such a plan. Remember what Gilgalad said are the two possible outcomes, or the two certain outcomes, if they are not healed, if, right, if the diminishing isn't stopped. If the diminishing isn't stopped, then either the elves will all have to leave Middle-earth, or the elves will all diminish and die. And in either case, darkness is going to win. Darkness will overspread the land and there's nothing anyone will be able to do about it. Now, notice again how in that construction, it really seems like the diminishing is a plan of the enemy, is a strike of darkness against the light, which is hard to understand how that could literally be true, right? Now, of the two options, either the elves leave, or the elves um, die, or the elves overcome the darkness, right? Which of those would, would be Sauron's probable preference? Well, okay, if they all did actually die, that would probably be easiest, right? But I don't think that that's actually what would happen or what will happen. Um, them all leaving might be convenient as they would then be out of the picture and couldn't oppose his domination of Middle Earth anymore. But remember, there could be awkwardness attached to that. Morgoth was overthrown at the end of the First Age when Eärendil went to Valinor, made a plea on behalf of the free peoples of Middle-earth, and convinced the Valar to come over to Middle-earth and stomp on Morgoth, right? If the elves all deport and head back to Valinor and abandon Middle-earth before they diminish, then there will be a whole bunch of folks over there in Valinor, potentially pleading, pleading for Middle-earth that has been abandoned. And that might backfire on Sauron. So I don't think that Sauron actually wants all the elves to leave. I think that his preference is option three, not them dying, which is, I think, not real, and not them leaving. He wants them to try to overcome this darkness, to overcome the diminishing by doing whatever it is they're going to do with the mithril. I, but that's why I, it makes perfect sense that that would be the setup for them ultimately to be making rings of power, right? The rings of power, I don't know what the link exactly is with the mithril. We know at least one ring of power was made from mithril. Galadriel's ring, Nenya, is formed from mithril. That we know. Why you would need massive quantities, the one little nugget, right, that Elrond has is almost certainly enough to make uh, Galadriel's ring all by itself. We don't need a big mining expedition if that's all the mithril that we need. Why he would need massive quantities of mithril, does it have something to do with the light of the Silmaril? Is that like the missing ingredient? Remember, Adar told us that Sauron has been doing all this research, trying to figure out how to uh, subordinate the flesh to the spirit, right? How to dominate over things with his will and his spirit. And there was some hole in his research, right? He didn't succeed in accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish. Maybe light from the Silmaril is the missing piece, right? Maybe that's the last thing that he needs. And so that's why he needs lots of mithril. I don't really know. But again, we need to remember what are the outcomes of all of the things? What is the result of the fact that Celebrimbor and, Gil and, and Gilgalad and the rest of them, and Elrond now being convinced by them, what is the, out the outcome of all of them believing what they believe? The outcome, the state that we have here at the end of episode seven is Celebrimbor is ready to go. 
He is ready. He's building the forges, um, the forges in which we know the rings of power are going to be forged. He, uh, Gilgalad is prepared. He is sufficiently alarmed, a high king concerned for the future of his people and the, the, the destiny and the mission and purpose of his people. He does not want his people to fade and die and he is willing to take steps and he sees what looks to him to be evidence in front of his own eye that, that, that bad things are happening, right? The corruption of the tree. And so therefore he is prepared to take whatever action is necessary in order to save his people. As I said, the forges have been built. We're ready to go with whatever it is we're going to do. Um, one thing of which is certainly going to be the rings of power, the forging of the rings of power. Everybody involved, all of the elves, everybody who knows about this at least already, is motivated to try to prevent the diminishing. Let's try to halt time. Let's stop the effect of the change of time and cease the, and, and, and halt the diminishing of the elves. And we know that these are things that are going to be associated with the elven rings of power, with the three. Is there even a possibility that Sauron knows full well about the presence of the Balrog and that a nice little side effect of this forging of Mithril, this, this mining of Mithril and bringing together of Mithril in order for him to move forward his big plan is going to be the unleashing of the Balrog upon khazad -dûm. That seems possible that he, can, that he knows about that and considers it a little bonus. Who knows? I don't know. But of course, let's not forget, Galadriel is coming now. Galadriel is on her way to Eregion and I presume will arrive in episode 8. And what exactly she will say about all these things? What, her, what will her perspective be? I gotta tell you, if episode 6 Galadriel had been heading to Eregion, I'd be really worried. But, as I explained in the earlier segment, Galadriel seems to have turned a corner. She's in a much better place. I'm actually kind of excited for Galadriel to get up there, and I think that her presence might help to expose some things, and I hope clear some of these things up. So, I still have not changed any of my basic views about what's happening up there in Linden and Eregion. All of this still seems to hold together. Everything that they're saying all of the truths and part truths, this, what I believe may well be a phantom link between the corruption of the tree and the diminishing of the elves, um, all of these things are setting the stage for the forging of the rings of power and for setting the people who should not say yes to rings of power to say yes to rings of power. And we will see what happens when Galadriel gets to Eregion. The three creepy figures that have been closing in on the stranger over the course of the last three episodes uh, are something we really need to talk about. It's hard to say exactly what they are because they never talk, but their silence, the eeriness of their silence, the uh, ritual ornamentation, it would seem, of their costume and of the props that they carry, all seem to suggest they're some kind of cultists or priestesses or something, some kind of religious or freaky something or other. It's hard to say, but they look like cultists. That's, so I'm going to refer to them as the three cultists. Um, now, one of the most important things that we see about them, this is really, really noticeable. They do magic. Now, remember, that's a big, big deal so far in this show. How much magic have we seen being done? Who has done magic of any kind? in this show. The Stranger and the Three Cultists. That's it. There's been no elf magic at any point. We've seen no elves or dwarves or anybody else doing magic at any point in this show. The only thing maybe you might consider counts is the magic boat to take them to Valinor, but that's not really elf magic. That's like the grace of the Valar opening the curtain and allowing them in. I don't think it was a magic property of the boat that enabled that to, to work out. So it's only the stranger in his act of healing, well, and of smashing the wolves. Um, so it's only, only the, the, the stranger and then the three cultists. And of course, what we see them doing in sucking in the fire from the torch, which was really eerie, and then blowing out the embers in order to ignite all of the wagons 
of the, uh, of, of the Harfoots. That fire magic was a, a legitimate exercise of magic. And that kind of magic, uh, magic that was literally involved in, in fire and smoke and lights, that's exactly how Gandalf's magic is described, how wizard magic is described in the books. There is something wizardly, I believe, about not only the stranger, but about these cultists, these others that are coming in. And of course, in addition to the fact that they are doing magic and doing fire magic, we see the obvious malice of these three strangers. Um, the burning of the wagons of the Harfoots was devastating, right? Devastating. They have practically, for all intents and purposes, condemned the Harfoots to a slow death. It's a horrible thing for them to do to them. Um, it would have been less malicious in, in, in some way to actually attack them and throw fireballs at them personally than just to so casually, so callously destroy what mattered most to them, what they rely upon most for survival, and then just turn and walk away. Uh, there was something really horrible in the way that that happened. So I believe that there is wizardly magic involved in all of these magic using figures that we've seen in the show so far. Um, let me talk about the blue wizards. As I've said from the beginning, I've been on team blue wizard when it comes to the stranger since before the season began. Um, now let me tell you a little bit more about the, the blue wizards. Uh, there are two versions of the Blue Wizards. We never got a story told about them, but Tolkien talked about them in a couple different places. The first and primary place where he talks about the Blue Wizards is in the essay on the Astari that you can read in the book Unfinished Tales. Now, in that essay, he says that the Blue Wizards failed. They went off into the east. They were supposed to help oppose Sauron in the eastern part of Middle-earth, but they went out there, and like Saruman down in Orthanc, they too fell prey to the desire for personal power and began instead building their own little kingdoms. In fact, Tolkien says that both of them became the head of magic cults. So they were the head of cults of sorcerers out there in the East. However, later on in his life, Tolkien seems to have changed his mind. He wrote even less about this, but from some of the writings that we have of his from his very last years, he seems to have been thinking that there, might be, there should be a version of the story of the Blue Wizards where they actually did good, where they didn't fail, but instead they went and they fought the darkness out in the east and probably helped to uh, you know, resist Sauron's strength so that you know, if the Blue Wizards hadn't been out there helping the people in the east, Sauron's armies would have been even stronger than they actually were and he might have won the War of the Ring and all that kind of thing. Right? So that was Tolkien's second idea about the Blue Wizards. So, my theory, what, based upon what I've seen and what I saw in episode seven, seemed to me to go along with this theory, to fit this theory pretty well, is that in the show, we're not only going to see that the stranger is one of the blue wizards, but that both of the blue wizards have arrived in Middle Earth. And that probably the thing that would, that would need to happen in order to make this theory work is that the other blue wizard, not the stranger, but the stranger's companion, would have to have arrived earlier, would have to arri have arrived some time ago, would have come first, and then the stranger would have come afterwards. This would explain why he's searching for something, something with that constellation, right, that he was drawing on the stone at first and then up in the sky with fireflies, and then the constellation that was represented uh, on the piece of parchment that was handed to him by Sadak in episode seven. That symbol would if this theory is correct, be attached to that other wheel. He's looking for his companion. He's looking for the other blue wizard. And so that's why he's searching for that. Now, what do we see when the three creepy cultists show up? One of them is carrying that round shield, which has on the inside that constellation shape, right? So therefore, the theory is that in their adaptation, the Rings of Power folks, right? JD and Patrick presented with this question, how would they treat the Blue Wizards? Which version of Tolkien's Blue Wizards are they going to do? Might decide to do both. Might have one Blue Wizard stay true, and the other Blue Wizard fall and become the head of a creepy magic cult. And that would, dis would explain what we're seeing, and why 
the creepy magic cultists seem to be using wizardly magic, but maliciously oriented. And why the stranger was looking for somebody who used their symbol, and they also are looking for him. So I don't know what this means. That is, I don't know if that means that the primary uh, cultist is the blue wizard, which is possible. Uh, they could have made the other blue wizard female and evil, as we see. So the one who blew the fire might possibly be the other blue wizard. It might be that these are the high priestesses of the other blue wizard's magic cult or something like that. So this is, my, this is the idea I've been having ever since I saw the cultists. What they did in episode seven really made me think that this might be true. There are other alternative theories, of course, that could be had to explain this, but I've never, I, I don't see much that's convincing about them. Of course, as always, there are some who think that it's probably Sauron. I cannot imagine how that could be true um, because of the way in which this story, the story of the cultists and the stranger, is so detached from everything else, from the story of the Southlands, from the story of, of Eregion and Linden and Khazad Doom, for Sauron to still be wandering around setting Harfoot wagons on fire in episode seven of season one seems a little hard to believe. So I certainly don't think uh, that uh, the primary Slim Shady cultist is Sauron himself. Uh, it's also possible that there's some other kind of creepy magic priest cult that has nothing to do with the Blue Wizards. I suppose that's possible. We know, for instance, that Sauron is very fond of using the cult worship thing in order to control populations. Um, whether the cults are worshiping Morgoth or whether they're worshiping Sauron himself, we know from Tolkien's writings that Sauron's approach in trying to control populations has often included one or the other of those two approaches. So maybe them coming out is evidence that Sauron has already made inroads further out to the east or south, perhaps, and that they are representatives of those cultures who are in a more advanced state of Sauron's dominion. It's possible. Um, I, I don't see how, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not in love with that idea, but I think that's at least a possibility um, of another alternative. Of course, there are many people who want to, who to want to associate them with the moon, too, and there's reason to do so. We keep seeing the moon, right, the shots of the moon, and one has to admit that the round disc that is being held by one of the, one of the cult priestesses does look like the moon. So I, don't th I still don't think that the stranger is the man in the moon, that the stranger is, you know, the, the Maya Tilian come to earth. I don't know why he would come to earth or how, or who's driving the moon, which is still apparently uh, going across the sky in its normal way uh, when he's gone. I don't know how any of that would be true, but it still does potentially support the idea. I could still imagine ways in which these cultists, if they, uh, these cultists, if they have something to do with the moon and the stranger, could still potentially go down in Hobbit history, in Hobbit tradition, that songs thousands of years down the road will remember this whole incident as part of the legend of how the man in the moon came, came down to earth. And it's true that the one priestess does have little cat ears, right? Could that be connected? To, is she, is she, is she going to play the fiddle at some point? If she does... I don't know. That could be pretty definitive. But again, I can easily see uh, the showrunners having some fun with the ways in which the traditional tales of this time are going to be passed down later on and how that's eventually going to manifest itself in the Man in the Moon song. That, I think, is a really fun and cool idea and would be really, really neat. But I don't think they can literally be the moon himself coming down to Earth. So there was a lot of interesting character development in episode seven, and many people said things that I think are gonna have long lasting impacts on the future trajectory of the story. But for Tolkien fans, there was one huge bombshell dropped in episode seven that overshadowed everything else. And that was Galadriel's reference to her husband, Celeborn, 
Holy cow, Kelleborn exists and they're already married. What do we do with this new information and how does that fit in? Well, let's back up for a second and talk about the marriage customs of the elves as far as we know them from Tolkien. Now, the marriage customs are that in time of war, the elves don't get married. Um, when they're focused on something else, like fighting a war, um, they, they don't have, they, they, they set aside a particular what's called the time of the children, the time when they get married and have kids. And when they're doing that, they're focusing all of their attention on that. And so they don't just do that in the middle of a time of war. Therefore, it was very interesting that Galadriel is, 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 has a memory of peace, of a time of peace when the war seemed very far away, as she said in the episode. And that's the time when apparently she met Celeborn and married Celeborn. She described the, the, the time of their meeting uh, when she was dancing in the flowers and he came upon her and watched her dancing, which is, of course, a direct parallel to the story of Baron and Luthien from the Silmarillion, though, of course, they didn't mention that. They can't tell that story, but they could establish that parallel uh, with Goadriel and Celeborn. And again, that is very much the idea, the concept of this oasis of peace in the middle of a time of war. So she says it was the, the war was very distant then. Back in this moment of peace, the two of them got married, and then Celeborn went off to war. And Galadriel describes watching him go off to war and saying that he didn't put on his armor right, that she was teasing him, that she was making fun of him when he went off to war. Think about what that tells us, what that suggests about what Galadriel was like at the time. Can you imagine the Galadriel that we have come to know over the course of season one, letting her husband go off to war by himself and not going with him or not leading him into battle? Uh, that was really interesting. It suggested that this was a time before Galadriel's character had changed to become what it has come now. But Galadriel is here changing again. I've heard some people after the episode seven dropped, asking the question, well, why has Galadriel, why is she just dropping this information now? Why have we never heard before that she was married to Celeborn? And to that, I would say, when did you expect her to talk about it? To whom did you expect her to talk about it? Just to drop it in random conversation all the time? I don't think she was in a mental place where she was gonna reflect back on that time of peace. She has been in a place of darkness. She has now, as I was arguing earlier on, made a shift. She has opened her eye. She has touched the darkness, and I think she is emerging out the other side. And in that moment, that correlates all of a sudden to her stopping in that conversation with Theo and remembering back to this time of peace when she did marry Celeborn, who then went off to the war, and she hasn't seen him since. Celeborn was lost, and they've now spent a long time time apart, an unknown amount of time apart, thousands of years, presumably. Um, an interesting thing is that Tolkien wrote many versions of the backstory of Galadriel and Celeborn. How they met, who Celeborn was, there are several versions of that. When and where they met, several versions of that, and how their relationship proceeded. But one thing that is consistent among every version of Galadriel and Celeborn's story interestingly, is long absences. They are often very long apart from each other, doing different things and being occupied with different stuff. What does, what is the relationship of Celeborn's absence to Galadriel's desire for vengeance? We know the link between, well, we know, we think we know anyway, the link between Galadriel's swearing of vengeance and her determination to hunt Sauron and Finrod's death. That was the thing that was emphasized at the beginning. She didn't talk about Celeborn in the prologue. She only talked about her brother. What role did her separation from Celeborn play? When did that come? Did it come before? I bet it did come before her brother died. Is that her response to both of those things? Now Galadriel's direction is changed. Now Goadriel, having touched the darkness, is now moving in a different direction. What is that going to mean? Is this the first hint of a setup towards her finding Celeborn? Is that going to be part of her road back from the darkness over the course of the next season or two seasons? 
I kind of, I kind of suspect so. Of course, I do not believe that Celeborn is dead. Theo asked if there were anyone that she had lost, and she, of course, immediately mentioned her brother that we knew, and then in this context, she mentions her husband Celeborn that we did not know had been lost. She speaks about them both as being lost. She doesn't know if Celeborn is dead or alive, but I think we have lots of reasons to believe that Celeborn is, of course, still alive and that she is going to find him again. She is going to discover him again. And as I say, I think that's going to be a really big part of her continued uh, emergence from the darkness that she's been in, not only through season one, but apparently for many centuries before that. Thanks for watching another episode of Rings and Realms. As usual, there is still much left to discuss. I didn't get a chance to talk about Elendil and his grief. I didn't get to talk about Bronwyn and where she is leading her people to. Nor did we talk about Isildur and his horse Beric, who is heading back to rescue him uh, as we left the episode. There's still a lot more that we can say and talk about, about those things and more. So if you have more questions and want to talk about more, you have several more opportunities to do that. You can go right away to Reddit and go to the Lord of the Rings on Prime subreddit. That's r slash L-O-T-R underscore on underscore prime. And you can join the wonderful discussion there. You can also join me and Maggie at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday for Other Minds and Hands, where we will be discussing these things more and being able to answer your questions as well. So if you join us on the Signum University Twitch channel, on th at Thursday at 4.30, uh, then you can join us there for that discussion. And also, I am delighted to say that Maggie's gonna be able to join me here. In all of Maggie's segments that she's been uh, contributing to Rings and Realms, she's had to do from her home over in Wales. She's gonna be joining me in the studio for episode eight, and that's just the beginning of the special things that we have in store, that we have planned out uh, for the finale episode. So I hope that you will join us next week for more Rings and Realms. Thanks, everybody.